Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Dan Markell? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll cover the background of Dan Markell. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Dan Markell was born in Toronto, Canada, on October 9, 1972. He earned a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and then would go on in 2001 to earn a JD from Harvard Law School. He worked as a law clerk and then joined a law firm who represented white-collar criminal defendants. In 2005, he was hired by Florida State University College of Law as a professor. He would marry Wendy Adelson in 2006. She was a law student who was seven years younger than Markel. They moved to Tallahassee, Florida. They had two sons and would divorce in 2013. Their divorce was acrimonious. The custody arrangement, as ordered by the court, was 50-50. Wendy had wanted to move with the children to Miami, but Markel had won a court decision that prevented this. This takes us to July 18, 2014. Markel had just returned from running errands and going to the gym when he pulled into his garage. He was on the phone at the time. He told the person he was talking to that somebody unfamiliar was in his driveway. A few moments later, Markel was shot to death. He was shot one time in the head as he was seated in his car. This was just before 11 a.m. Initially, the only information made public about the case was that Markel was murdered and he was the intended victim of the crime. About a year later, the police would say they were interested in locating a silver Toyota Prius. This takes us to May 26, 2016. The police revealed they arrested a 34-year-old man named Sigfredo Garcia and charged him with first-degree murder. They indicated it was a murder for hire involving Garcia and another man, 33-year-old Luis Rivera. Rivera was already in prison on unrelated racketeering charges. The two had apparently driven from Miami to Tallahassee in a Toyota Prius. They spent a couple nights in a motel before murdering Markel. Based on witness statements, video from security cameras, cell phone records, and their electronic toll system, the police believed that Garcia and Rivera had followed Markel in their vehicle on the morning of July 18, 2014, only to eventually confront him at his home and shoot him. The police would say that the murder-for-hire plot worked like this. A man named Charles Adelson, who was the brother of Markel's ex-wife Wendy, along with Donna Adelson, the mother of Wendy and Charles, employed a woman named Catherine Magbanawa as an intermediary to hire Garcia and Rivera. Magbanawa had been in a romantic relationship at different times with both Charles Adelson and Garcia. The police believed that Wendy Adelson wanted to be able to move to Miami with her children and Markel, of course, had won that court decision, which prevented her from doing that. Magbanawa was arrested on October 1, 2016. Just three days later, Rivera cut a deal with the government. He was sentenced to 19 years in prison in exchange for pleading guilty to second-degree murder. He had already been sentenced to 12 and a half years for the racketeering, and these sentences would run concurrent. So by the end of the deal, he only really added six and a half years. He implicated Catherine McBanua and Garcia, but he said he didn't know who hired them. He only knew that the murder was because a lady wanted her two kids back. All the Adelsons deny any involvement in the homicide. McBanua and Garcia would be tried together for murder and other charges. The government treated Charles and Donna Adelson as unindicted co-conspirators, so they were not charged, but the government is saying they were involved. The government said that Charles Adelson had made arrangements to pay Magbanua, Garcia, and Rivera $100,000 to commit the homicide. Garcia said that Rivera had committed the murder by himself. Magbanua said that she had nothing to do with it, but after looking at the prosecution's case, she thought maybe Wendy Adelson had been involved in the murder. Garcia was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 30 years. As far as Magbanua, the jury could not reach a verdict. She will be retried in 2021. 
Now moving to my analysis, Dan and Wendy had a relationship that their friends and family appeared to admire, like they were an ideal couple. They had it all. They were happy, affectionate. Apparently, they called each other Mr. Bear and Mrs. Bear. I suppose this was a method of inducing nausea in bystanders. It's hard to see any other purpose for it. Their bear name fueled euphoria would not last. At some point, Wendy, who was described as quirky and charismatic, believed that Dan did not view her as an equal. For example, she wrote a book and he would not read it. He was focused on his own career. On a podcast, she would say, I thought I could beat the system and marry a man I lacked passion and love for. Interesting choice of words, beat the system. I wonder if she thought she could beat the system later on as well. Wendy apparently ambushed Dan with divorce. Initially, he wanted to reconcile, but then she made it clear she wanted to take the children to Miami. After this, he started filing motions in court. In one filing, he described how Wendy initiated a Pearl Harbor-like separation. He also demanded that Wendy's mother, Donna, could not have unsupervised visits with the children. As upset as they both were about the divorce, they both found romantic partners very quickly. After Markel was killed, Wendy suggested that the police should take a look at her new boyfriend, like he could have been involved. So that relationship soured pretty quickly. It sounds like they didn't even make it to the bare name phase. Maybe she just found him unbearable. For this part, the new boyfriend had a lot to say to the police about Wendy and her family. He talked about how disturbing the Adelson family was, how they were obsessed with Markel. The boyfriend even mentioned how Wendy told him Charles looked into having Markel murdered, something Wendy Adelson would deny in court. The big question, of course, in this case is, were the Adelsons involved in Markel's murder? The government appears to think that they were, but there's not enough evidence to charge them. We see the government talking about how McBanoa had received suspicious checks. Also, there were phone calls between McBanoa and the Adelsons. Some circumstantial evidence, but there is no smoking gun here. The whole key to the case appears to be McBanoa. I'm surprised that if the Adelsons were involved, McBanoa wasn't offered some type of deal to turn on them. Maybe she was. Perhaps she thinks it's in her best interest to take her chances at trial. I don't know if the Adelsons were involved, but talking hypothetically about a structure like this, where a family hires a person to hire other people to commit murder, we see an interesting failure of logic. The idea here is that the individual who wants the victim dead can mitigate their risk by hiring someone else who in turn hires the actual killer. So the killer wouldn't know who the person who ordered the murder really was. Most murder-for-hire plots don't involve the person in the middle. Rather, it's just an individual who wants another person dead hiring a killer directly, even though this type of scheme removes the direct homicide risk. For example, gunshot residue on one's hand, being caught on surveillance video, having trouble putting together an alibi. It introduces a new type of risk, the killer's getting caught and talking, which can lead to the intermediary talking. There's other evidence as well to worry about, including communication and payments. There's always something to hide. This type of plot only shifts the risk somewhere else. It does not eliminate risk. The people doing the hiring in this situation are trusting people who literally were willing to take money to commit homicide. Not a group known for being highly agreeable. There's another logical problem with this type of crime. We see that in a police interview of Rivera, he said that he was talking to Garcia at one point and said they should just rob Wendy. So it was Rivera's idea to simply rob Wendy. It's not clear if Rivera knew Wendy by name, but he knew that there was a person who wanted to be able to move with her children. From the point of view of the actual people pulling the trigger, this route is more logical. If all they want is money, there are less risky ways to get it than to carry out a murder. Robbing someone in Wendy's position the person who allegedly wants the victim dead, would have been much more efficient because it eliminates the whole problem of a co-conspirator testifying against them. And of course, robbery is a lesser crime as compared to murder. It's not like somebody in Wendy's position could run to the police and say, I was trying to hire these people to kill my husband and now they're trying to steal from me. It's like calling the police and reporting that someone 
stole your 10-pound shipment of cocaine. There are going to be legal consequences for that behavior. The last part I want to cover here has to do with the purpose of the murder. Again, allegedly, it was so Wendy Adelson could move with her children. Murder is not necessary to meet this goal. She could have just left with them. Now, of course, that would be another crime. But again, it would be less severe than murder. Furthermore, there are other crimes that could have been committed that would have accomplished the same goal, like having Garcia and Rivera frame Markel for some type of criminal action, like making entry into his home and planting drugs, or simply hiring someone to say Markel attacked them. It may not have been enough to result in a conviction, or maybe not even an arrest, but it may have affected the custody hearings. Criminals never consider harm reduction. They never look at a situation and say, can I commit a lesser crime and still accomplish my goal? This makes me think that if this really was a murder-for-hire plot, it was probably more than just moving with children. It was probably about something like revenge. The actual object was to have Dan Markell not be alive anymore, not to simply accomplish some logistical goal outside of that. This was a tragic case that really did not have to occur. There are other ways to settle disputes outside of homicide. And sometimes in divorces, people don't always get their way. Sometimes people just have to accept that there are limitations to what can happen. When people start thinking that anything is possible, that can be dangerous. Those are my thoughts on the Dan Markell case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.